Oral questions by members? Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, people across this province are fed up with an NDP ideology that puts the rights of violent repeat criminal offenders over the rights of communities to feel safe. We saw this again on Saturday when the NDP Mayor of Vancouver was kicked out by voters tired of seeing violent repeat offenders facing no consequences. And that happened despite the former Attorney General and likely the next NDP leader publicly endorsing Kennedy Stewart and in fact spending the weekend door knocking in an attempt to maintain the status quo. Well, the public finally had their opportunity to pass judgment on the former Attorney General's failed approach to keeping our streets safe. And boy, did they ever. So in light of that repudiation, if they're not going to listen to the opposition, will the NDP Attorney General listen to the voters and get rid of the former NDP Attorney General's failed catch and release policies that are resulting in streets that are not safe and finally implement policies that put the public's right to safety before a criminal's right to reoffend. Premier. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, I, I appreciate that uh, the leader of the official opposition wants to keep uh, a, a bumper sticker going, but he would also know that voters repudiated the former Solicitor General in Langley quite decisively over the weekend. And, um, and nobody, nobody on this side is suggesting that it has anything to do with the policies that are largely driven by Supreme Court decisions, again, which members on that side of the House know. We have been working diligently to try and make the best of a bad situation that we inherited, quite frankly, from the former Solicitor General and the former Attorney General. No policy change has happened, Honourable Speaker, in the past five years. None, zero, except for our efforts to try and make the best of a bad situation. And I know my two colleagues will be answering the rest of the questions, but I, didn't not, I did not want this place to be sullied, quite frankly, by comparing what happens in a municipal election where 37 mayors were defeated in big cities and small cities right across British Columbia. This is for us to all figure out, but to tie it to a public policy question is absurd, and the member knows that. Leader of the Official Opposition, Supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, that answer is part of the problem. It demonstrates exactly the problem we have, where the Premier might call it bumper sticker, but let me tell you, the people that are being assaulted don't consider this bumper sticker. We've got a, the former Attorney General, who's going to be the next NDP leader, apparently, who spent five years doing nothing and finally, under pressure, appoints two consultants to tell him how to do his job. Then we get the current Attorney General flying to Ottawa with the Solicitor General, pretending that they're suddenly concerned about a bill that, well, the current Attorney General was an MP in Ottawa, said didn't go far enough in being soft on criminals. He couldn't support it because it wasn't soft enough. Well, let me tell you, just this weekend, Mr. Speaker, in Vancouver alone, the Vancouver Police Department received 1,500 calls. 1,500 calls where they were calls for assaults, weapons, property offenses. We saw someone brutally stabbed. We saw a man that was shot in the chest with a crossbow. We saw a woman on the corner of Pender and Canby sucker punched in the face for no reason by a random stranger. And yet another violent random assault in Chinatown where a 93-year-old gentleman who had lived there for over 30 years thrown to the ground with a broken hip. These are not bumper stickers. These are British Columbians that are saying that the failed approach that this government has taken, being soft on crime, is failing communities. And that was the message that was sent in every community across this province. So enough is enough. Will this Attorney General and his predecessors catch and release and finally put policy changes that put public safety first? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. 
First of all, I want to express compassion for those people who are the victims of the random street offenses that the honourable member referred to. It's simply unacceptable that this would happen in a civilized society, and we're going to get to the bottom of it, Mr. Speaker. We went not to Ottawa, as the member asserted, but to Halifax, the uh, uh, Public Safety and Solicitor General and myself, and I'm very proud to announce, Mr. Speaker, that we secured a national commitment to address repeat offending. Mr. Speaker, what became clear when we talked to the other Attorneys General from other provinces and territories is this is a national problem. It is not limited to, to British Columbia at all. It was Manitoba and Ontario who spoke passionately in response to our interventions. Governments, of course, that are a different stripe than ours, but we are united in trying to get the attention of the federal government to step up, and I'm confident that they will. Member for Vancouver Langara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, with the response from the current Attorney General, as far as we know, what we saw was the Minister for Public Safety and Solicitor General and this Attorney General, they went across this country to Halifax to secure another meeting. We need action now. We need a government that will take responsibility for community safety, not shift blame to others. That's all we hear from this government. This government needs to recognize that the former Attorney General's soft on crime approach is not working. Vancouver's Chinatown is being torn apart by violent random attacks enabled by the former Attorney General's catch and release system. The latest victim is a 93-year-old man who has lived in Chinatown for 30 years and now lays, lies in the hospital with a broken hip. And now we learn that two dangerous prolific offenders have again broken bail, one who viciously assaulted a longtime Chinatown security guard and another who attacked an 87-year-old senior in Chinatown with bear spray. This prolific offender has already breached probation 14 times, but was given bail and sent back into our community. This lawlessness and chaos must end. When will this Attorney General stop the catch and release system so residents will be able to feel safe in our community again? Attorney General. I agree with the member for Vancouver Langara. We need action now. And we are not shifting blame to others. We started this process of engagement with the Urban Mayor's Caucus of British Columbia. We took their concerns to the Attorney General of Canada, and he agreed that action was needed, Mr. Speaker. Members. It is not. Mr. Speaker, presumably the opposition will understand that we cannot change the criminal code on, in a day. They will understand that we need federal action because that's a federal area of responsibility. And they will understand that we need funds to do the kind of things that are necessary to deal not just with the crimes, which are horrific, but with the causes of those crimes. We want to be tough on both crime and on the causes of crime. Mr. Speaker, that requires spending money and a considerable investment in social programs. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker to make real change, we need a prolific offenders management program, which reduced, which reduced recidivism by 40 per cent in one year. What did the opposition do when they were in government? They cut that program. Mr. Speaker, we need... Members, Mr. members, Spe order. Mr. Speaker, we need complex care housing for people. And we have done 20 new facilities where 500 people and more are currently housed. More is needed. We accept that. Mr. Speaker, we need community transition teams. So those who come out of correctional facilities are looked after for at least 90 days now so they can find their way to the community without becoming repeat offenders. Mr. Speaker, we need to spend funds and we need federal government help to do that. Mr. Speaker, the government's action in cutting programs savagely doesn't give them credibility when it comes to dealing with the causes of repeat offenders. Member for Vancouver, Langara, supplemental. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I think we have agreement in this House. People need action from this government now. Yes. 
And with respect to the current Attorney General, the concept of action now is not months and months and months of talk. Read the Lepard Butler report. It sets out the policy directives can be given from government to the BC Prosecution Service. That's what we're calling for. We are calling for those policy directives from this government to keep repeat offenders off the streets. That's an action this government can take today. Mr. Speaker, people are feeling scared and vulnerable in our neighbourhoods in the face of the former Attorney General's soft on crime approach. Communities like Vancouver's Yale Town and Chinatown do not need more doubling down on failed NDP policies. Under the NDP, Vancouver has become the anti-Asian hate crime capital of North America, fueled by false political narratives and scapegoating by the former Attorney General. NDP social justice activists have even called for small businesses to be boycotted when they plead for more help. Activist groups like the former Attorney General's own Pivot Legal are attacking business owners in Chinatown for merely calling for more police so they can feel safe again. When will this NDP government stop ignoring our demand for basic public safety and restore law and order in Chinatown? Attorney General. There's no question, Mr. Speaker, that the member is correct in saying people deserve to feel safe in their community, whether it's Chinatown or anywhere else in this province. We have 500 Crown Council who are doing their job every day under the law. Mr. Speaker, the notion of a directive is something that has been discussed in the past and, may, and is under consideration. But, Mr. Speaker, I point out to you, I point out to you that that has to be. I continue. I would, of course, hope that the opposition understands that that directive has to be compliant with the Criminal Code of Canada and with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, to simply wave a magic wand and say, this is it. When we have people on the ground, Crown Council, every day, doing their job, under the leadership of someone who was appointed under the leadership of the former government, who we have enormous confidence in, they are doing their job. Mr. Speaker, the things I spoke of to deal with the causes of crime, the root causes that I referred to earlier require social investment, and that is why we went to the federal government and are going to be working with them to get the funds we need to do more in that area, something the former government did little or nothing about. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. We, we do indeed have a lot of overlapping emergencies in this province. I'd like to take a small inventory of what's happening right now under this government's watch. A gas pipeline is being drilled under a sacred river. Primary forests are being cut for pellets to be burned. Old growth continues to be logged. Work is underway for more LNG development. Meeting with oil and gas lobbyists happens as many as times as 80 times a month. We have a future of more fracking, more drilling, and more pipelines. And this government has made it clear it has no interest in actually transitioning our economy. You can see the evidence in the budget. The evidence is in the expected growing revenue from gas and in the billions of subsidies to the LNG industry. Clean BC is and will be used like a smoke screen while the public chokes on actual smoke from wildfires burning right now and we are in the driest 90-day period in Victoria's history. Through you, Honourable Speaker, to the Premier, how does he justify expanding fossil fuel development in a climate emergency? Premier. Oh, well, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And uh, certainly we have experienced unprecedented wildfires over the past five years. Uh, that's public record. Uh, we are working diligently on Clean BC, uh, something that we worked with the former leader of the Green Party to bring forward. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work of the Minister of Environment and the former Green Caucus in being able to do that. These are very challenging times, not just for British Columbia and Canada or North America, but globally. By Christmas, there will be 8 billion souls on this planet. And we have to have a plan that fits into what the rest of the world is doing. That's why we've been working as best we can with the federal government to make sure that as British Columbians lift their weight, others do as well. 
uh, the member will know, if she's been paying attention, that the oil and gas subsidies she referred to have been eliminated by the Minister of Energy. He's happy to give her a briefing on that if she missed it. Leader of third party, supplemental. Oh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Good to have a little bit of patronizing response there. Uh, the the uh, subsidies that I'm referring to are the $6 billion that were given to LNG Canada as the giveaway package in Bill 10 under this government. Those have not been eliminated. Those subsidies exist to prop up that industry when we should be transitioning to clean energy in this province. Those are the subsidies I'm talking about, and I don't need a briefing on those. This government doesn't seem to know an emergency if it hits them like a ton of bricks, except if a climate activist runs to be leader of the party, they'll respond to that like an emergency. <laughs> stifling, stifling democratic... Members, members, let's hear the question. Members, 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 stifling democratic debate in their own party, allowing oil growth to continue to be logged, pointing fingers, subsidizing oil and gas, anything it seems, but take the actual and urgent steps to move us away from a fossil fuel based economy. Through you, Honourable Speaker, again to the Premier. Atmospheric rivers, heat domes, droughts, wildfires, species collapse. Lifting our weight in BC seems to mostly be about lifting our emissions. What will it take for this government to treat climate change like the emergency that it is? Minister of Environment. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. What it takes for this government to treat the threats of climate change as the emergency that it is, is our commitment to each other and to the people of British Columbia to make the slow, everyday, steady progress in every area of society, whether it is energy, whether it is transportation, whether it is buildings and communities, to work with local governments to bring down emissions steadily to ensure that we protect vulnerable people while we do that with the sort of supports that we see uh, through the Climate Action Tax Credit, as well as uh, incentives, rebates, and support to transition their homes to low carbon and to clean energy, their transportation to investments in public transit, through acceleration of uh, active transportation initiatives, as well as supporting zero emission vehicles. There is so much that we have done. There is so much more to do. It's contained in our Clean BC plan, which also addresses reducing emissions from the oil and gas sector by a minimum of 33 per cent by 2030. We're getting on with the work. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, British Columbians don't believe the Attorney General's false indignation when he blames Bill C-75 for the chaos in our streets. The Attorney General should remember his own words, and I quote, requiring the least onerous form of release be imposed is a good thing, end quote. Oh. Now, when the AG uh, said these words, he was speaking for all of his federal NDP caucus colleagues at the time. And guess what? Several of those uh, colleagues are now colleagues with him, and they serve here in this chamber today. The Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, the member for Coquitlam Burke Mountain, they all are here and serve with this Attorney General. They can remind the Attorney General of what he said, what, what, what his words were, because they agreed with him that Bill C-75 was too lenient at the time. And the impact of the NDP's soft on crime approach is being felt by all British Columbians, notably police officers on the front lines. As Chief Mike Sir of the Abbotsford Police said, and I quote, they put our community in harm's way despite multiple arrests and multiple charges, and they're out on the streets before our members have even finished the paperwork. Bluntly, I'm mad about it, end quote. Simple question to the, to the Attorney General. When will the NDP keep making people safe 
the, the number one priority and end the lawlessness and the chaos which is gripping communities all over British Columbia. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think it's really important that we put the emphasis on the things that need to be done to address the conflict rather than simply calling out each other for... I actually voted against that bill in case the member didn't notice. And in, other, and in any event, I did work in the Justice Committee to try to improve it. But that's not the point, Mr. Speaker. The point is there were... Un all the Attorneys General Members. of Canada, all the Justice... All of the uh, Solicitors General and Public Safety Ministers were united in saying that there were unintended consequences of Bill C-75 as regards repeat offenders with these random street violence situations. Every part of the country made that point to the Attorney General of Canada who listened. Now, Mr. Speaker, it's important that we focus on the things that we can do, and not just an, uh, with Ottawa's hope, uh, hope for funding that we will need, but already what we are doing. We brought back the prolific offender management program. We have brought back... We have, we have created peer-assisted care teams, which was the number one recommendation of the experts that we were appointed, that will provide civil-led response to people who are in drug crisis or who have, uh, who have mental health issues. We've got them rolling out in Victoria and New West, and there'll be one in the North Shore this fall. Complex care housing is identified as an essential part of the solution, Mr. Speaker, and we have provided, as I said, $164 million in budget 2022 to create 20 new facilities where over 500 people are housed. Finally, Mr. Speaker, it's important the new community transition team expansion will help people who are leaving uh, penal institutions to reduce the chances of reoffending. For 90 days, they'll be given wraparound support. All of those concrete steps, Mr. Speaker, are there to ensure that our streets are safer in the future. We got lots more to do, Mr. Speaker, but that's, a, 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 I think, a significant commitment we've already made to address this problem. Opposition House Leader, supplemental. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let's be clear. While the Attorney General stands here and says that. Uh, oh, British Columbians, I want you to know that I voted against Bill C-75. The other part of that story that he's not being honest with British Columbians about is he's not telling British Columbians Member. that the reason he voted against it was because it wasn't lenient enough. Exactly. It wasn't lenient enough. It wasn't soft enough. That's why the, the Attorney General voted against it at the time, along with his other caucus colleagues who were there with him. Exactly. Now, Mr. Speaker, the lack of action on the part of this government is breathtaking. There's been an explosion of violent crime and social chaos as a result of the former At Attorney General's uh, catch and release system. Last week, uh, S uh, Sergeant Steve Addison of the Vancouver Police said, and I quote, without a doubt, it's the worst I've ever seen, end quote. British Columbians deserve to be protected from violent, prolific offenders who assault, but then are quickly released, only to assault again, hurting more and more innocent people. Innocent victims like the young woman from Coquitlam who was struck in the head with a hammer while walking down the street with her friends. The prolific of offender responsible for this vicious hammer attack has been in and out of the former Attorney General's catch and release system and was released just days before this attack on this young woman. What is it going to take for the NDP to take real action to protect people from relentless violent random attacks? And when will the NDP end the former Attorney General's catch and release justice system? Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, it was the Attorney Generals of other provinces, like I mentioned, Manitoba and Ontario in particular, who said that the consequences of Bill C-75 and later charter cases like Zora were not intended. Mr. Speaker, they are taking the kind of steps that we are taking to, that, that I, I mentioned in my last answer. To set, suggest there's a lack of action on our part is simply not, not credible. Mr. Speaker, the, the Honourable Member referred to a, 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 a Chief of Police, I, I'll refer to another, Victoria Police Chief Del Manick, who said when, in response to the reinstatement of the prolific uh, offender management program that the last government cut, that the program was a success. When it was in effect, Victoria Police were at the table with corrections and social workers to discuss how each individual offender would fit into the community. 
when people were going to be released on conditions or had finished their sentence, the prolific offender manager group would come together. We actually had a, a say in discussing each individual case. Mr. Speaker, the Police Federation of Canada, Rob Farrer of the National Police Federation, also said all of the parties coming together and figuring out a model, that's absolutely necessary. One of the things we've called for, that would be corrections, police, crown, different ministries, mental health, social development, everybody coming together to figure out a best practice and move forward. Those are the things we're reinstating, Mr. Speaker, among many other measures to make a real difference on the streets of communities large and small across our province. Member for City South. Mr. Speaker, this government has failed to take action in a timely manner. They have had months to take action, in fact. They heard from the BC Urban Mayor's Caucus more than half a year ago about the issue of prolific offenders. They've had months to secure a meeting with the government to discuss Bill C-75 regarding bail, and every day that they waited to take action, on average four people were assaulted, randomly attacked, just in Vancouver alone. And with four random assaults taking place just in Vancouver every day, that's 40 innocent victims that have been assaulted since this House rose 10 days ago. Mr. Speaker, I have had to personally talk to people as a police officer in Surrey and tell them that the person that hurt them the one that upended their lives and filled them with fear is back out on the street. And time after time, violent prolific offenders with lengthy criminal records are being released into the community to reoffend. A prolific offender who had been charged with hitting a 19-year-old student over the head with a pole and shouting racial slurs at her, despite the efforts of police, he was released last week. This is a violent, prolific offender who has 30 convictions, 30 convictions for assault, assault with a weapon, and uttering threats. So when will this Attorney General get serious, please, and put the public's right to safety over a prolific offender's right to reoffend? Thank you. Attorney General. Well, thank you. And the incident that the honourable member from Surrey South recounts is uh, horrific. Uh, we have spoken with the Urban Mayor's Caucus before going to uh, meet our counterpart in Ottawa. We have uh, they, we've had enormous support from them as we've done, gone about this work. When I personally met uh, uh, Attorney General Lametti, I had the a letter from them, the report from the urban mayors, and discussed it with them. We are going to brief them in light of the, uh, in the uh, success we had just last week again. We're working closely with them because we accept that there's a partnership between local government and the province. And Mr. Speaker, we need a partnership as well with the federal government, and that is what we are achieving. We're going to ask for continued support in a number of ways. But Mr. Speaker, Crown Council, no matter how many they are, no matter how competent they are, are subject to the laws of the land. And we can only ask them to do what the laws require. And if those laws need to be changed, that is exactly what we're going to do. I wish we could wave a magic wand and have Parliament make those amendments right now. But I, if the Honourable Member is suggesting the Crown ought not to follow the law, I'm sure she's not. We cannot and will not do that, Mr. Speaker. What we are going to do is provide the supports that are needed to be tough not only on crime and continue to prosecute, but also tough on the causes of crime. Members. Mr. Speaker. I should point out that we have increased since we became government the budget of the Crown Council Office by almost a third. In the last year of the, government, oh, the former government's uh, mandate, the, the increase in budget was less than 1%. Wow. Here, here. Member for Kamloops, North Thompson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, what this Attorney General fails to realize is we keep asking them to bring in directives, which they are allowed to do, which they can control, and they could have taken action ever since C-75 came in. But this Attorney General doesn't want us to actually know what he said about C-75. He said it didn't, uh, it was too strong. It wasn't uh, uh, lenient enough for prolific offenders. He was more worried about the prolific offenders then than he was about the public. The former Attorney General for the last five years was of a similar mind. In fact, what he said in 2011 about the vaunted prolific offender program was the same thing. And this is what he says, and I quote, 
We have serious concerns with the results of this program and are continuing to investigate the aggressive policing tactics. Oh. End quote. Oh. Any day now, he's expected to be the next leader slash premier of this province, and we're supposed to believe that the prolific offender program is going to continue on for any length of time when you have a current attorney general that thinks C-75 was too lenient and a former attorney general that thinks the prolific offender program was too aggressive. And in the meantime, we have people getting assaulted randomly daily. Unprovoked strangers attacked every single day. A prolific offender attacked a 70-year-old stranger from behind, punching and kicking him. 45 minutes later, he approached a woman from behind and punched her in the face. But he wasn't done there yet, sir. No, no, no. Then an hour and a half later, he stabbed. He stabbed another woman. Quite an hour and a half for that prolific offender. Two days after, a 54-year-old woman suffered serious injuries and after the same prolific attack, offender attacked her in a violent home invasion. So Mr. Speaker, this side of the House doesn't think these are bumper stickers. We don't think the former Attorney General's soft on crime approach of catch and release is a bumper sticker. We're with the public that want to feel safe in their own communities, their own homes. When is this Attorney General going to take actual meaningful lasting action to protect people versus the criminals? Attorney General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, inc the incidents that the Honourable Member refers to are horrible. Nothing, nothing more, nothing less. And I, uh, my heart goes out to the victims of those crimes. We, in respect of the Prolific Offender Management Program, we have committed publicly to fund that program, something that we needed to do since the last government cut it, despite its 40 per cent success rate. And that is something that will continue. That is what we've announced. Mr. Speaker, this is a serious problem that sloganeering is not going to solve. We are with the public. We are going to take the steps with our municipal and with our federal partners to get it right for British Columbians. That's exactly what we're doing. The balance question period.